You've always had what it takes to make it happen. And we know the right tools can make it easier. At Strayer University, we're always thinking about new ways to set you up for success. That's why we give you a brand new laptop when you enroll in a bachelor's program. So you can start off on the right foot and keep striving. Visit Strayer.edu to learn more. Eligibility rules, restrictions, and exclusions apply. Connect with us for details. Strayer University is certified to operate in Virginia by Chef. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, my name is Melanie Waxman, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation titled, What Educators Don't Know About ADHD and Need To. Leading today's presentation is Evelyn Pope Green. Active in ADHD and mental health advocacy for almost 30 years, Evelyn has served as a leader representing the family and educator voice in the ADHD and mental health communities. She is a past president of both ADA and CHAD and works as an administrator with the Chicago Public Schools. Given the prevalence of ADHD, every educator should assume they'll be teaching at least one student with attention deficit, if not more. But for many reasons, few educators receive adequate information about training related to this condition. In today's webinar, our expert will equip educators with essential ADHD facts and practical solutions so that each one of your students can shine. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking this poll question to our live audience. What is the biggest challenge for teachers in supporting students with ADHD at your school? Please select your answers and comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. And for answers to common webinar questions about slides, transcripts, and certificates of attendance, click on the FAQ tab of your webinar screen. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 472 to access the webinar resources, or simply click on the episode description wherever you stream your podcast. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Click the magazine tab on screen to learn more. Finally, today's sponsor is Play Attention. Backed by research conducted by Tufts University School of Medicine, Play Attention provides the most advanced NASA-inspired technology that improves executive function and self-regulation. Turn your ADHD into your superpower. Our digital trainer will teach cognitive skills so you can go to infinity and beyond. Your program, program will include a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Home and professional programs are available. Call. 1-828-676-2240 or click the link on the screen to schedule your free one-on-one -on -one consultation. You can visit www.playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Evelyn Pope Green. Thank you so much for joining us today and leading this discussion. Sure, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. So today we're going to talk about um, ADHD for educators, but I, I need to preface it with the fact that while I'm an educator, I'm also an adult with ADHD and a parent of two adult sons with ADHD. So a lot of what I'm going to say is colored from both of those perspectives, um, as well as my perspective as an advocate for ADHD for over 30 years. So um, I, I hope this is going to be valuable to everyone. 
So um, let's start with a few facts and fallacies. Um, and these are kind of pulled out, especially for educators around ADHD. And um, the first one is obviously there to ADHD only affects boys. And, and actually, um, too many of us still think of ADHD as a disorder for little boys, especially little white boys. Um, and we forget that it is a, a disorder that crosses all racial, socioeconomic class, it, it everybody, gender lines, um, everyone um, can and does have ADHD. So um, one of the things that we have to realize that is girls get missed as much as they do. And I just looked at statistics yesterday to make sure that I was still correct about this. Boys are still being um, diagnosed, not twice as much as which is what it used to be. So not quite that much, but they're still being diagnosed at significantly higher rates than girls. Um, but that's because too many of us still think of ADHD with the hyperactivity piece um, and don't think about the other characteristics of attention deficit disorder. So um, with girls, it manifests itself with, well, not just girls, with inattentive, inattentive type, you know, boys as well, um, or in adults. I'm saying girls and boys, but this also goes for adults. It manifests itself differently. Girls will be daydreaming. Um, what you might see in, in some kids as they get older, especially, is less of an external hyperactivity and more of an internal hyperactivity, which means, you know, mind racing, really having a hard time concentrating on things. Um, so just, you know, wanted to remind everybody that it ADHD affects everyone. And so um, that's especially important for us to recognize in the classroom. Um, the the next one is all of brown meds. And, uh, you know, what I really just want to say is um, I need teachers to understand, educators to understand that medication is not a magic bullet. It doesn't, it's, it's one part of a comprehensive treatment plan. Um, not every individual with ADHD is helped by medication, um, and it does not affect everyone the same way. And there are many different ADHD medications now, unlike, you know, 30 years ago when I first started this journey, when we only had Ritalin. And um, it, it's um, different different medic it, it it's a trial so you i'm asking educators to, to for two things one understand that your input is important to figuring out what's um what medication is working, when it's working, when it might need to be changed. So when when parents and doctors ask you for that information, um, it's it's not just for fun. They really need to have it and it helps them determine whether or not dosages or actual meds need to be changed. So um, just recognize that you have that important role in uh, medication management. Um, one of the things I want to say again is remembering that it's not a magic bullet, which I think sometimes um, educators think it's going to be, especially those who maybe aren't as well versed um, in a ADHD. Um, I, I, I want to use a quote that my older son said when he was about I don't know, eight, right after he, he started meds when he was seven. So he'd been on them about a year. And one day the teacher said to him, or one of his teachers, it wasn't his regular teacher, but said to him, oh, you must not have taken your medication today. And his response was, the meds don't make me behave better. They just make me slow down enough to behave. So I want us to remember that they are not a, a behavior, a magic behavior bullet. Um, so. All right, on to the next ones. Uh, so I um, just want to say that sometimes, and I, I don't think this is such a big deal in the education community, but it's certainly, you know, you still might hear it in other communities or with, with uh, lay folks who may not be as familiar. I hope that educators understand that Students with ADHD are just as smart as any other kids. Sometimes um, they're they're often gifted. They're not always gifted in that traditional way. They are often creator creatives, um, you know, artists, actors, writers, etc. Or they're gifted in athletics or sports or music. 
Um, however, ADHD is also very likely to be accompanied by learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, or um, oppositional defiant disorder. So it usually comes with a friend. <laughs> um, and so we need to keep that in mind. Um, students with ADHD are also looking at this, the second fact, are also very likely to act out and it might make us think that they're being purposely defiant or disruptive when actually they're just frustrated or experiencing emo emotional dysregulation, which is one of the characteristics of ADHD. You'll most likely see those behaviors when they're having difficulties with the transition, experiencing um, RSD or rejection sensitive dysphoria, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but basically that's when um, individuals experience some severe emotional pain because they feel rejected or feel like they failed at something. So, um, it, it, or if they're tired for any number of reasons, but low frustration tolerance is again, another characteristic of ADHD. So, um, you, you know, you may see bouts of acting out, anger, crying, feelings of failure and, and self-doubt among other things, especially when the RSD is involved. Okay. So I wanted to share with you um, this slide, which is um, a tool. If there's a single tool in your toolbox that I think you should have, it is this one. It's this iceberg, which is developed by um, my good friend, Chris Dendy and her son, Alex. And the iceberg describes many of the characteristics and behaviors associated with ADHD, especially those a teacher is likely to see. Um, so I gave you the link here where you can find it on attitudemag.com. Um, Chris, who unfortunately recently passed away, was a real pioneer in the area of executive function and one of the first to really talk about it extensively and to link it to school performance. She also was uh, my personal mentor and hero. And as I told some folks earlier, kept my son alive when <laughs> when I was frustrated. <laughs> he kept me going. So, um, so I want to apologize because I know this is very, very difficult to see. Um, and again, I gave you the link so you can get at it. I just wanted to get a little up, uh, up a little closer so you can see some of those um, kind of headings there. Um, the top of the iceberg shows all of those typical behaviors that we associate with ADHD, the impulsivity, hyperactivity, inattention, and some of the behaviors or characteristics you might see that go along with those. But it's those deficits, behaviors, and characteristics that exist below the surface where folks with ADHD run into the most problems. Um, things like sleep disturbances. I don't know if you can see that statistic, statistic but about... Um, 56%, I think, is the percentage that's on this particular slide. I'll have to look. I did not look that one up beforehand, but it's a pretty high percentage of folks with ADHD have sleep disturbances. Then there's also, again, emotional dysregulation, um, weak executive function skills, poor, like poor working memory and problem solving skills, learning disabilities, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, um, uh, problem solving skill, poor, oh, I said problem solving skills, um, time blindness, which is a huge one, which we people don't always know about and, and don't address it because they don't understand it, but are, are confused and frustrated when kids and adults with ADHD are late all the time or don't give the proper amount of time that you think they need to, co to complete a task. Um, it's time blindness and the inability to kind of figure out what that means and when you need to leave to get somewhere and those kind of things. And then, of course, there are the coexisting conditions like um, depression, anxiety, and oppositional defiant disorder that also are kind of exists below that that iceberg line. So, so continuing to talk a little bit about executive function, I first of all, I need to give credit to my good friend, Carolyn McGuire, uh, for this graphic. And I forgot to cite her on this slide. So <laughs> um, I had to text her today and say, oh, I sent my slides in and forgot to cite you. But um, she actually has a webinar in the Attitude webinar series that I highly recommend, especially if you're dealing with children who need help with social skills, which is almost any child with ADHD. Um, I love this chart because it lays out exactly what EF is, and I think it's a great illustration of all the things that are needed 
um, to do one single task for most people and why a seemingly a seemingly simple task um, like reading or completing a, an assignment or even, you know, remembering to put the right papers in your book bag, um, why all those things can be so difficult for folks with ADHD. Because when you look at the, I mean, there are six different and distinct kind of things that we have to do. One of the best descriptions of executive function that I think I've ever read or seen or heard is from Dr. Tam Brown. Um, And in one of his books, he discusses he, he describes and uses the analogy of a conductor um, with executive functioning skills and how executive function is that conductor. And you need the conductor to put all the different instruments to have them play together properly. And without the conductor, it's just this cacophony of sound that is, you know, jarring and doesn't make sense. And nobody knows when to play what when. And so um, that's a little bit what executive function is like. And if those things aren't firing up the right way, then you're going to have difficulty trying to create, trying to complete, again, the simplest task. So um, I just want to emphasize the importance. I said we had a couple of questions that came in beforehand and a couple of people did mention executive function. Unfortunately, this is not an, an EF workshop, so I don't have time to talk about it in more detail, but I would definitely say um, you might want to look at Chris Dendy's, um, some of her books. A lot of them, she concentrated on teens, but her books transfer, that information transfers across the ages. Um, she did some some work with me with preschoolers and ADHD. So she has a lot of information about executive function. There's a lot of information out there now, unlike, you know, a few years ago. So let's talk about some things that educators should know. <laughs> and so one of the first ones is that getting started, getting activated, and then staying motivated um, are often difficult, if not impossible, for children and adults with ADHD. For me personally, that getting started with a task is where my poor executive functioning skills um, get me every single time. I have a hard time getting started with almost any task from writing an article to washing my car. Anything can, can I just have a hard time getting started with it. Once I get started, I'm good to go and often end up hyper focused and have to pull myself away from it. Um, and, you know, we'll go at something for hours on end without a break once I get started. But that getting started piece is very difficult. Um, for But for some students with ADHD, it's not just the getting started or it's not the getting started. It's actually staying motivated is the, is the issue. So hopefully some of these ideas here will help you get them started, um, and then keep them motivated. I want to add that um, that last one um, about allowing for creativity in assignments and demonstrating knowledge is so important. Um, letting um, students show, demonstrate their knowledge in different ways using different modalities um, is important for all kids, not just those with ADHD. But we know that, you know, not everybody learns the same way. So if we can give kids opportunities other than a sit down paper and pencil test to show us what they know, um, it makes it makes them feel better about education. And it really gives us an idea of of their knowledge base and what they've learned. So. So. You are, <laughs> you just resign yourself. Folks with ADHD are going to forget things and lose things. Um, and so if, now I started to say, if you have kids with ADHD, you do have children in your classroom with ADHD. They may not be diagnosed. They may not be identified, but believe me, you do. Um, and so they're going to lose or forget things. So let's make it easier for them not to. Um this is another one of those executive function challenges. Um, and so um, we want to do things like, I mean, we talked about some of the challenges, but now, you know, looking at some of the accommodations and solutions, technology is a huge one, a huge, huge, huge one. Anytime we can use technology with um, our kids with ADHD, it is great. 
um, if they can do homework, if they can send it to you via email so they don't have to bring those papers in, um, if you can um, do things like text assignments, um, all the various education apps that are out there, use technology as much as possible um, to help with the some of the executive functioning issues, especially forgetting and losing paperwork, pencils, the works, everything. Um, I also wanted to just give a little reminder that it's likely that at least one parent has ADHD or that there are other siblings with ADHD in the home. So when you're trying to figure out how to communicate with parents, use those same accommodations, the same technology that you're using with kids. Try to use it with parents, if at all possible. Okay. I keep losing where to advance my slides on the screen. Um, uh, other things educators should know is um, that executive function deficits affect students in surprising ways. Um, including difficulty with working memory, which we've talked about. I think all of these are pretty self-explanatory, but I can't emphasize enough how important visual reminders can be for your children with um, ADHD, your students with ADHD, but all of your students. And for any parents that might be um, listening, you can use those visual reminders at home too. Um, I started with at a very early age making a list. My son could never figure out what to do when he woke up in the morning. He like wandered around just crazy, not being able to figure out the simplest things. So he had a list of things. And, you know, initially it was visual pictures. And then when he could read, it was words so that he knew it was on the back of his bedroom door. And he knew exactly what to do. It was like a little checklist. Um, every day. So those I can't just emphasize how important those visual schedules can be. And you can use them with preschoolers and with high schoolers. You're just going to change kind of their appearance. But um, you can also do things to make sure that homework assignments are, are like do things like make sure that you write homework assignments on the board every day. That that's like a routine um, and the students know that they can always go there to get it and that you give both written and oral directions, verbal directions for a task. Um, those kind of things can be tremendously helpful for children who have weak executive function skills, um, particularly their working memory. So um, other things educators should know about working with students with ADHD. And this is a big one. And I, I use this desk, this walking desk on purpose. I'll explain a little bit more in a minute about it. But one of the things that we don't often recognize is the students often know when they are about to lose it. They know, um, especially when we've given them some social emotional learning, when we've taught them um, about, you know, their emotions and when they're feeling things and what that feels like, what their body feels like and what they should do. So, um, you know, we need to help them recognize it with younger children so that they can recognize it as they get older. And older children typically can tell when they're at their breaking point. What we can do is to give them, and, and this, uh, this avoids the tantrum, this avoids the meltdown in the classroom. We want to give them an outlet to quietly and discreetly deal with what with their kind of, you know, um, that volcano blowing up inside of them without calling attention to it, without embarrassing them, without doing any of that. So, um, and, and this is just an example. In, in high school, my son, actually it started in elementary school. So from fifth grade through high school, he was able to get up and leave the room when he felt his emotions getting out of control, when he was angry about something, when he was, you know, he just felt like he was going to lose it. Um, he could just get up. One year, he went to the AP's office. Um, other years, he just, he was able to just walk the hall. In high school, he went to his case manager slash resource um, pullout teacher when he had those feelings when he needed to leave the room. In some cases, he needed to have a pass, so he had a special pass. Others, they didn't care if he was walking the halls as long as he wasn't disruptive, and he knew that he would lose that privilege if he abused it, so he did not. Um, he was only able to do this, though, because we taught him to recognize his emotions. So back to this walking desk that I'm showing you there. Um, the, one thing that we know is the move is that movement and exercise are really, really important for individuals with ADHD. Um, if 
you'd like more information about that, um, because there's a whole body of of information and and science behind it, I would recommend John Rady's book, Spark, the Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain. That's um, Rady, R-A-T-E-Y. Anyone who's familiar with um, Ned Hollowell, he wrote um, Driven to Distraction with Ned originally many, many years ago. But um, he's the one who first turned me on to, to walking and standing desks like these and, and actually re- recommends them for every school. Says it just makes a tremendous difference. So um, another thing that we want to talk about educators knowing, sorry, I'm in my office and things are falling around me. <laughs> um this one is about us, so it's a little little more sensitive, but the truth is that ADHD is actually a matter of tolerance, um, and in this case, specifically our tolerance as educators. I was a great preschool teacher because I could tolerate a lot, <laughs> probably because I had ADHD. Um, I had a great time the year that I had 18 out of the 20 kids in my classroom were very active boys, whereas I know other teachers that would have driven crazy, so we need to recognize that it's our tolerance level um, for for ADHD. So we need to understand. So sometimes we can get angry. We need to understand. And this is us as parents as well. We need to understand um, how the words we say and the actions we take can simply devastate a child. And I'd also caution you to be aware that kids with ADHD are often bullied and scapegoated, sometimes because of their lack of social skills and social awareness. Um, Make sure that you're really paying attention to what's happening before the kid with ADHD has the meltdown. Um, It's not happening in isolation. Something caused it. So really pay attention um, to to what's happening. Kids often get bullied. All right. So um, let's talk about, man, time is going by fast. Let's talk about working with families. Um, I feel like these suggestions here are just common sense, but I put them there anyway, because the truth is um, it was teachers that were, it was the empathetic understanding teachers that were willing to work with us that made a difference for both of of my kids and for me um, when it comes to their education. He, uh, my oldest actually went from first grade through fourth grade before we got an IEP because he had great teachers and understanding teachers who worked with us and were just willing to implement whatever accommodations he needed to be successful. So I'm not going to talk about the teacher from hell that he had in fifth grade that changed all that and was the reason we got the IEP. But I'm just going to tell you that he went from being a happy-go-lucky, engaging 10-year-old to a child that was talking about killing himself. And the only thing that changed in that period was is what was happening at school. So I, I tell that story because I want us to understand as educators what an impact we can have on families and students, positive and negative, based on what we see and what we allow to happen in our classrooms. So, okay, so let's talk about the real deal with working with families. (laughs) Um, Again, some, just some helpful hints about working with families of kids with ADHD. And, and, and you know, I'm saying that, but they, they work with any family for that matter. We, I don't really have time to address it here, but there's also, um, I, I want everyone to be aware there's a cultural component to working with families, um, especially families that are of a different culture than yours. And so that's something to keep in mind and to try, you know, you want to be culturally responsive to the kids and families that you're working with um, and keep that in mind. And you have to also keep it in mind. I have not said this, but I should have probably early on is that we need to make sure that what we're identifying and um, when we identify behavior in one kid, if we're looking at a child of a different race and we're looking, you know, we look at a, at a white kid and say a white boy and say, Hey, you know, boys will be boys. And then we look at a, a black kid and say, Oh, that's behavior that we have to deal with. Remember that, remember that your own um, implicit bias comes into play and we all have them. We all have them. Um, and so just remember that, that it, that's part of working with families and with kids. So these are some lists of quick and effective accommodations, and we're down to about 10 minutes. So I have a few of these, but I don't want to leave things things out. Um, 
homework that makes a whole family miserable and causes the child to hate school isn't worth it for you, them, anyone. So reduce homework and in-class assignments for kids who struggle with it. If it's skill and drill, you know what? You can tell if they've um, mastered the skill, whether they do 50 50 problems or 100. (laughs) So, you know, doing every other problem instead of every single one is going to give you the same, it's going to yield the same information for you, which is the only reason that we do homework. I will tell you um, honestly that as a parent, one of the things that I said to teachers was, I am not going to be responsible for what happens with homework because we have enough things that we butt heads about and I'm not going to let homework be the thing that destroys my relationship with my child. And so what that meant was, and what I said to them is, I'm going to give you all of the, um, I'm going to give him all of the space that he needs. I'm going to give him the the tools that he needs to do his homework, everything that he needs, but I'm not going to fight with him about it. If he need, if you know, if he asks me for help, I'm going to give it to him, but I'm not going to fight and argue with him about doing homework. And the reason I came to that conclusion is because literally in first grade, homework that should have taken and probably did take his classmates. Well, I know it did because I asked his, you know, classmates' parents, took them 15, 20 minutes to do. It was taking him three hours. And he was crying through the whole thing. It was painful. He had a lot of problems with um, dysgraphia. So so writing was painful for him. It was just too much. And so, you know, that was the conclusion I came to. Most of his teachers understood it. And I said to them, you know, whatever the consequences are for him not doing his homework, I will support you in those. But I just want you to know, don't call me and say he didn't do his homework. (laughs) Because... I'm not going to deal with it. It's not going to be the thing that, um, again, destroys my relationship. So, okay. Um, Next. So, um, you know, one of the things, this very first one talks about fidgets and, and getting them for all students. And so I just, you know, once the novelty wears off, sure, everybody, you know, if you have a basket of fidgets, everybody's going to want to use them. But once the novelty wears off, only the kids who need them will use them. Um, so, and the same thing, you know, and then there may be times when kids who typically don't need them do need it for some reason. Something's going on and they just, you know, need it. So why not have them there for everybody? Using, um, you know, many different modalities for instruction is going to really keep kids in, in engaged. Um, when it comes to organization, encouraging the use of binders and a simple organizational system uh, for keeping track of papers and assignments if you're not using technology. But again, I recommend technology. Um, But recognize that it still might not work. We had binders every year. My kids still papers everywhere. I would literally see the homework paper. So I want to say this to to our educators too, because I know it happened for me. I would literally see the homework go into the binder. I would watch them put it in the binder, watch them put the binder in their book bag and they would get to school and the homework would be gone. I call their book bags the big black hole because stuff would go in and just disappear. So just understand that uh, that's one of the reasons I recommend technology because um, you know, those binders and other kind of things don't always work. Um, give students time in, in new environments to visit, to explore, to spend time there, to make the transition easier. One of the things real quickly I did for uh, one of my sons as he was transitioning into high school is the high school happened to have some programs there that summer. And I sent him and he did everything that summer from yoga to drama to debate. But the reason I was sitting him was so that he could become comfortable with the school, learn where things were, figure out how to navigate. It's, it was like a five a high school that had five floors. You know, we live in Chicago, so it was huge. So that was so important to his success when he got there. Um, so anytime you can give kids, whatever the transition is, um, an opportunity to to become familiar with the environment before a transition, that's important. Okay, um, I'm going to end this by saying that um, all kids might benefit from these accommodations, but if you're not comfortable with that, not, you know, some, you know, I talked about giving fidgets to everybody. Um, One of the things that I know to be true, both from my experience with my sons and my personal experience as an educator, is what 
happens, what we do, what accommodations and modifications we provide for those kids with ADHD or even other learning disabilities, especially when it comes to executive functioning. If we provide that for everyone, it just makes the entire class better. I can't tell you how many of his teachers would say to me, thank you for telling me that um, when we implemented it and I implemented it for everyone, everyone's scores went up. Our whole classroom became a happier place. So just remember that those things that you're, you know, implementing for the kids with ADHD, you might be able to implement for everybody and it'll make a difference. But either way, what I want us always to remember is that what is fair is not always what is equal. So kids may not be getting the exact same things, but as long as we're giving them what they need to succeed, then we're doing our jobs as educators. And I did not just, you know, FYI, I didn't talk about each one of these individual ones. If you have questions, when we get to the questions, feel free to, to ask me. I, you know, you didn't need me to read those to you. You can see them yourself. Um, so, so I've got a few, we just got a few more minutes and I've got some gems that I've learned <laughs> um, over the years as an educator and as, as a mom about um, living with two boys with ADHD, uh, adults now, and my own ADHD. So um, the one here that, I, again, I'm not going to read these to you or go talk about each one individually. If you have questions, we can address them during the Q&A. But um, I really want to address this one about finding the passion piece. I've seen it over and over and over again, including in my own two kids. Um, and for me, when I think back, but what we have to be aware of is that kids with ADHD need to, it might be challenging for them to find their, their passion because they tend to want to try everything, you know, and one year my son played the trombone, the saxophone and soccer and baseball and football. <laughs> so it may be challenging for us. They, they may need to try a lot of things before they get to the one that, that works for them. But it's so important because once they find that passion, we can use that to help overcome whatever challenges they're facing. Um, the next little set of ADHD gems. Um, I, I just don't say about this one, that very last one. One of the reasons why it's important to work with families is because it can be life changing for the family and maybe for you, too. But um, it, it, again, Parents may have ADHD and dealing with all the same things that their kids are dealing with, including that emotional dysregulation and RSD and all those things, having, feeling like they have a partner, like somebody understands them and is not being critical of them can be life-changing for them, just like it can be for a student that has a teacher and, and uh, that treats them that way. So keep that in mind. I don't think we often remember how much what we do and say can affect families. Um, these are kind of self-explanatory, but, you know, st girls, students with an inattentive, inattentive type, um, those who don't cause us any problems, they're not disruptive at all. Um, they often become overlooked when it comes to an ADHD diagnosis. Don't ignore it. You know, if you feel it in your gut, if you have concerns, don't ignore them. Um, I just want to remind everyone what terrible repercussions come from not treating and dealing with ADHD. Um, everything from substance abuse to uh, teen pregnancy to, you know, car accidents and then financial issues and underemployment, under and unemployment and relationship issues as children get older. So um, not dealing with ADHD is, is a problem. Um, certain grades when kids are likely, when ADHD might show up, like, you know, that you may not see it as a preschooler, but you will see it as a, um, Kindergarten, you know, you may see it in kindergarten. You may see it in first or third grade because those are times when, you know, the, the curriculum becomes more difficult. Suddenly they have to sit still for six hours when they never had to do before. Middle school, you know, depending on my son, when he went to junior high, it was a school where suddenly instead of being in one class with one teacher, he had many classes, many teachers. He went from all A's. I didn't even know he had ADHD and I had been an ADHD advocate for years. I still feel badly as a parent that I didn't recognize it. Um, but he was um, 
he was the one that actually said to me, I think I should get a diagnosis because I don't under he didn't understand what was happening to him going from straight A's to all these issues. But it was that's when his ADHD manifested itself. For me, it it was, you know, in, in college was the first time. I didn't I wasn't, you know, diagnosed for years after that, but I recognize now that that's what was happening to me. So um let's see, we're almost well, actually, we're at time. So let me try to quickly get through the last couple slides. Um, a couple of you in your pre-questions asked about um, how do you um, maybe share information with your colleagues. And so um, modeling good good ADHD practices for your colleagues so they can see it, suggest books. And one of the biggest things you can do is get Chris's iceberg poster and hang it up in the teacher's lounge. Let them see that. Have discussions about it. You can also invite, you know, um, your chair group coaches, folks to come in to, for PTA meetings and those kind of things. People loved it when we I brought my chair group in to talk to teachers. Um, this is a big one. And it often this is one of the things that people don't know and we should know it, individuals with ADHD are developmentally three to five years behind their peers, their neurotypical peers. So for me, I, I knew this. This is one of those things that Chris Dindy taught me, but it didn't hit home to me till I drove away after dropping my 18 year off at college and realized that I really had just dropped an 18, a 14 year old off. So just remember that as you're dealing with these kids, it's more socially than anything else. Um, but, you know, not so much academically or cognitively, but with their you know, social skills and the like. Um, teach kids to self-advocate um, because they're going to have to eventually. Kids with ADHD become adults with ADHD, and we need to teach them early and often um, how to advocate for themselves. And um, finally... Here are just some resources, and I've also given you my email address where you can reach me if you have questions beyond what we get a chance to address today. Um, these are some organizations that'll help. This um, Through a Child's Eyes videos are, I cannot tell you how impactful they are for us as educators and even for parents to take a look at. And there's a whole series of them, including ones about attention issues and other, you know, ADHD related challenges. Um, I have to say that Ad Attitude Magazine's educator resources are top notch. You got the best folks in the business um, sharing information. So I absolutely, you know, recommend that you take a look at those. And again, there's my um, email address. You can contact me if you have any questions. And with that, thank you very much for taking the time to join us and listen today. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That was just wonderful and so insightful. I, we got a ton of great questions from our audience today. And before we jump into those, though, I just would like to thank Play Attention again for sponsoring this webinar. And I also would like to share the final results from today's poll question. Uh, we asked, what is the biggest challenge for teachers in supporting students with ADHD? And the top three uh, comments from our audience today was, Number one, addressing classroom behaviors. Number two is providing accommodations. And the third top uh, issue and challenge that teachers have in the classroom is creating inclusive lesson plans. So all things that you touched on today with your presentation. Um, and with that, I'd like to just jump into our questions we, you had mentioned um, Chris Dundee's wonderful iceberg poster, and we do have that um, PDF available on our website, and mm -hmm. we invite everyone to download it and hang it very large in their classrooms. Um, but with that, how one of the questions we got was, how can we normalize ADHD in the classroom? Um, are there other suggestions that kind of help students understand attention deficit that teachers can use? Um, yes. It it depends upon the age, how you do it. And I think you have to be delicate. And one of the things is that the kid with ADHD has to be comfortable too, because you don't want to embarrass them again, all that, you know, the emo emotional dysregulation, RSD. So hopefully we can first make them comfortable with it. And then you can do things like just, you know, what I think if you're just matter of fact about it that's the way we raised our kids it was like you have adhd that means you're gonna have some challenges that other kids don't and so to just say that to the other kids in the classroom he, he, he has some challenges that you don't you you know you can't 
play baseball very well. He can't remember to, to write down his homework very well. So I'm asking you to be his study buddy. Um, those kind of things. I think if we just talk about it honestly, um, that's one of my biggest pet peeves with both parents and educators is we try to pretend like the kid does not have ADHD or like, you know, if we talk about it, it's a big secret. And it's not. It's it's a fact of life. You know, there really is no such thing as neurotypical. We all have something. And so I think if we talk about it for everyone, not just the kid with ADHD, but if we just normalize talking about our challenges and and what we can do to overcome them and how they're just part of life. I think that's the the best way that we can do it. Absolutely. And uh, you had mentioned that children with ADHD grow up to be adults with ADHD. Yes, they do. (laughs) (laughs) And so this kind of play, this question plays into that. How can I best support students with ADHD when they become overwhelmed or frustrated? Um, And, I have it as well. <laughs> how do I how do I help them? And then how do I manage my own emotional regulation when teaching students with ADHD? So it's a two partner there. Yeah, um, I think again, giving them those outlets that I talked about, like talking to them beforehand. You don't you're not going to have this conversation initially in front of all the other kids, but pulling them aside and say, you know what? I know sometimes it feels like it's too much, and you need a break. What can we do? Talk with them about what can we do. What will make you kind of be able to to get a hold of yourself and feel better. And sometimes if their parent or if nobody has done this before, they may not really understand it again, depending on age. So you may first have to help them say, okay, what does your body feel like when you, when you're getting angry? Um, does your face get hot? Can you feel, you know, so when you start to feel those things, what kind of things can we do to make you feel better? So whether it's a quiet corner in the room or something like, you know, what my son had where he could get up and walk out, Whatever it is, those kind of things help um, to, and and it again, it does those things. The other things I talked about, it normalizes it, and it also helps. Um, it helps the other students recognize what's going on, and it gives them a way to learn how to cope with their own um, feelings and issues and, and ways to 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 deal with them in an acceptable manner. That's not you know having a tantrum and throwing things across the room. And then for us personally, I actually. And I'm going to say this, I, I I have trouble with my own emotional regulation. I, and especially when my kids were teenagers, especially the oldest one who was the real challenge, I said some things to that child that no mother should probably say to their son or child. I always apologized. And so we can do the same thing as a teacher. If we have, you know, we lose it, um, which we will, you know, everybody does sometimes because it teaches them that it's okay to apologize, that everybody loses it sometimes and that, um, you know, words do hurt, but they don't necessarily, especially if you, if, you know, somebody with ADHD that it, it, it wasn't said in, it was more about you than about the person um, and your feelings. So I think being able to do that and just, you know, recognizing it and I, you know, saying just, I, I'm such a believer in just being honest about all these things. So saying, you know, you have made me so angry that, and I used to take time out as a parent, not as a, as a teacher so much because I taught babies, but as a parent, I used to take time. I'd be like, I'm going in my room and shut the door because otherwise I'm going to do or say something that I shouldn't say. So sometimes we have to take the time out. So I hope that helps. <laughs> That's good advice. <laughs> and managing time and resources, that came in number four in our poll. So this is another two-part question. Uh, one viewer asked, how can I help my students manage their time more effectively? And then another viewer asked, when I struggle with time blindness too. <laughs> so again, how do you help oh, that, the students manage oh my God. The, the activating, the getting started and time blindness are the two. I mean, I am a grown adult about ready to retire from my job. I know, and I recognize it. I know I have time blindness. Does it still not stop me from saying, okay, my appointment is at 1030, so um, I'm going to leave it 1025 <laughs> and think that I'm going to get somewhere on time. It, I, you know. So um, there are some tricks that you can do, especially the adult that's you know saying that they have their own time blindness. One of the things we did in our house, this is going to sound crazy, but it worked. Every clock in our house, although all of our watches, the clocks in the car, they were all set at a different time. And, you know, with our ADHD, I didn't remember which one was on the right time. So that meant the one, and, you know, most of them were set ahead. There were a couple that were slow, but most of them were set ahead. So whatever the, 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 whatever 
the the most advanced time was, that was a time we had to assume it really was because we didn't really know which clock was right and which one wasn't. Um, and so that helped us to get out of the door as a family much easier than it did. Sounds kind of nutty, but it worked. It was a thing that worked. Using things like time timers to help them, to give them reminders and say, okay, we're almost done with this assignment. Do you want to take five minutes and take a look at your assignment to make sure that, you know, you haven't missed anything or you got them all wrong? So I think giving those reminders, teaching them to use my, use their technology there. I don't know if you guys heard, but I put a timer on my phone for 1040 because I knew we were supposed to stop for questions then. And I knew that I would keep talking if I didn't have a way to remind myself. So I use timers for all kinds of things. Um, timers and alarms to help remind me of things and to help with my time, you know, keeping up with time. So teach children how to do that. So they're able to kind of manage their own um, time better and understand and teach them, you know, teach them that time blindness is a thing so that, you know, say you need to be aware that, you know, you're going to think you can do this in this much time, but it's really going to take this much. So give yourself that buffer of time to get it done. Um, if you break things down, which is one of the things we advise anyway, it's to break like bigger projects down into smaller projects. That also gives them an opportunity to figure out how long it takes to do things. So to, you know, to write that outline, because otherwise when they think about the whole thing, it becomes overwhelming. Um, and it's also hard to gauge how long it's going to take. But if you break it down so you can say, OK, I can write that outline in an hour. Um, as opposed to, you know, three days to finish the entire project. So the more you can break things down and help them, remind them to like keep track of how long it's taking to do things. Because we we forget what it takes, how long it takes. And you have the great suggestion about providing fidgets to all your students <laughs> with the caveat that the ones who don't need them will probably lose interest, but the ones who do <laughs> will, will continue using them. Do you have some recommendations for classroom fidgets that are not distracting but work well? Um, squeeze balls are always good. Those are always good. Okay, so this is not a fidget, but this is an old ADHD trick. Like when I first started doing this advocacy 30 years ago, <laughs> a rubber band, although I wouldn't recommend a rubber band because those hurt, but like a, a hair tie, an elastic hair tie or something that they can just kind of flick on their on their wrist um because some kids need that physical sensation too so that'll help with that um there are things called um tangles and so they they're like little pieces of plastic and you, they come apart and they come back together and they really don't make any noise but you can do all kinds of things with them i will recommend there is um first of all amazon has lots of fidgets that you can take a look at um and then there's a, a company called um trainers warehouse and they have a website you can go to their warehouse they have all kinds of fidgets you can buy them individually or as a group um but those are two places i would recommend looking and then you can see what kind of things there are so many available i can't even think of what they all are um there are some there's one that i like to use it's metal i don't have one on my desk today um and it like opens and closes it can be like a globe and then it gets smaller it doesn't make any noise at all but it's something they can do and the other thing to remember is like some kids just like shaking their leg is is their movement thing and just let that be okay i know there are teachers who are like be still be still well you know you're not being still you're walking in front of the classroom so they shouldn't have to be still for six hours so those are those are great suggestions we also have just a little plug here we have quite a few gift guides on the editingmag.com website where we have a lot of great suggestions for fidgets as well oh, okay <laughs> that's the one that you mentioned and uh, one of the another question we got was um, how to get educators interested in learning more about ADHD without harming our professional relationships so what if a, an educator is resistant and another educator wants to help get them more informed? Mm -hmm. Um, well, again, that's what I said, you know, put that poster up in the teacher's lounge and talk about it. Um, you know, even subtly talking about a kid that you had that, you know, that and, and how something worked. You don't want to talk about the negative, you know, how frustrating it makes you. But, oh, look at what I I mean, I tried this one and it's wonderful and it it's helped the whole class. Um, so that's one way. Just kind of quietly model and talk about things. Um, you know what? 
ask, you know, administrator, if you can bring somebody in on PD days or something to talk about it. It has to be somebody good and dynamic that's going to know. I'm going to tell you the truth. What <laughs> what I have found has helped over the, you know, these many years I've been doing ADHD advocacy is when you bring in somebody. Um, so whether it's like I, I make my son do stuff all the time. <laughs> And we do, we've done presentations together because when they can hear from the horse's mouth, what a difference a teacher has made for them or something that you've done or whatever, if you can, if you can let them hear that and let them feel it um, and see the impact that you have to change you have to change hearts and minds is what you have to do. And so sometimes the only way to do that is for them to to see it, to believe it, to hear it from the horse's mouth. And on the flip side of that, how would you, uh, one question we got was how should I inform parents if I observe clear ADHD symptoms in students who have not been diagnosed? Identifying ADHD symptoms actually came in at number five in our poll. So what okay. advice do you have to that educator? <laughs> Well, I, you know, my first bit of advice is we have to be careful because we are not diagnosticians. And I don't think it happens as much now as it used to, probably because there's so much worry about, you know, folks being sued or having to do evaluations. Um, back when I first started, it, it, you know, one of the things that we cautioned teachers all the time was don't tell somebody that their kid has ADHD because you don't know. Now, I say that laughingly because the way that we found out is one of his teachers a son had ADHD and she said, and she did not say Perry has ADHD. She said, and it actually took, she didn't do it right away. It was after some amount of time. And then she came up to me one day when I picked him up from school and she said, you know what? I'm looking at Perry and he reminds me so much of my own son, Ari, who has ADHD. And then, you know, then she talked about some of the characteristics that were the same. And she said, you might want to take him in for an evaluation. And it wasn't I, the way she came to me made it first of all i knew parents know when stuff is not exactly right i mean he was my first so i you know as a first time parent i wasn't exactly sure but i also was in early childhood education so i had some idea that developmentally something was off um parents usually know and so to give them a suggestion like that in that gentle kind of not accusatory not you know you're in denial not you know you don't want to say any of those things Things. But, um, you know, that's one way. And to say, and then the other thing that I do often um, is to say, I'm seeing this behavior at school and I'm just wondering, do you see it at home? And if you do, what do you do about it? I mean, how do you, you know, what's your solution to it? And maybe we can try it at home and we can exchange ideas or whatever, and then just get to talking about it. And then, you know, you suggest that they might want to see about either an, an evaluation you know what I like to the, the other reason that we have to be very careful and I, I did not say this I don't think anywhere in the presentation but I like to say it and I try to remember to say it ADHD is a medical diagnosis yes it's part of IDEA and it's one of the 13 disability well it's not one of the 13 disability categories but it lands in OHI and other health impaired um and so, yes, educationally, they can, you know, you can do an evaluation, but what you really need is a medical diagnosis because it's a medical disorder. That's that's great advice. And um, unfortunately, that has to be our last question today. But Evelyn, we I just want to thank you so much for joining us and contributing your voice to this ADHD community. I'm sure our audience has received a ton of great ideas and uh, will help them be better educators and help their students' successes. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> thank you for having me. And I'd also like to thank today's listeners. Uh, if you'd like more information on today's topic, we encourage you to check out Attitude's latest ebook, The Teacher's Guide to ADHD Behavior. This resource features an in-depth look at common behavior challenges facing students with ADHD and solutions and strategies that teachers can use to help improve those behaviors in the classroom. Click the link on the screen or visit attitudemag.com slash shop for details. And to ensure that you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates, you can sign up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast number 472 to access the webinar resources. 
or simply click on the episode description wherever you stream your podcast. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Thank you and have a great afternoon. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G dot com. You love podcasts, the stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.